This is CBC Here and Now. This has absolutely zero to do with politics. I mean, our public health system is designed for the public. A St. John's company offers COVID-19 testing for a fee, but is then paying Eastern Health to process the results. Hey, Cornerbrookers, have you spotted these big, beautiful, bright signs all over town? Well, wondering what they're all about? During this challenging time, um, people just need to see something that can lift their spirits. That would be a really great opportunity to beautify Cornerbrook. I'll give you the details. Welcome to Here and Now, I'm Carolyn Stokes. We have new details tonight about a private lab in St. John's offering COVID-19 testing for a price. Avalon Laboratories is offering the service but can't process the tests itself, so it struck a deal to use Eastern Health's lab. Here and Now's Heather Gillis explains. There's a huge economic benefit to, to providing this private testing. Paul Antle's Avalon Laboratories is offering private COVID-19 testing to companies in mining, oil and gas, the fishery, film and television, and other industries. Until his lab is accredited, the tests are being processed by Eastern Health's public health lab on a fee-for-service basis, even though in a statement Eastern Health says the public health laboratory does not typically provide private, non-insured testing. So when we test out, out there for people who are not showing any symptoms, and we catch one, before they go into an, uh, an environment where they're in contact with other people, uh, that's wonderful. We have just averted, you know, a, a mini disaster. Still, the situation is raising questions from the progressive conservatives. Another example, I guess, of uh, well-connected uh, liberals and uh, in the last five years seem to have uh, find ways of getting jobs and, and getting contracts. And Antle says that's not the case. This has absolutely zero to do with politics. I mean, this is about protecting our economy and protecting the people in our province. Antle says his private testing is good for the economy and has allowed his first customer, Pope Productions, to begin shooting the television show Hudson and Rex. He likens the testing to drug and alcohol testing many employees in various industries already take. This is nowhere near uh, two, uh, creating a two-tiered system. This is just another diagnostic test that a, an employer is going to need in order to feel comfortable or the employees need to be comfortable uh, going back to work. In a statement, the Department of Health says Eastern Health's lab has enough capacity. The public health lab has capacity for 1,500 COVID-19 tests per day. The current demand for tests from public health is less than 400 tests per day. If there's a need for more testing to be done, we should be doing it. Antle says all public tests take priority over ones from Avalon Laboratories. Premier Dwight Ball says people with symptoms can get tested for free and that people aren't jumping the queue when they get private testing. The, uh, the test there is usually a requirement or a condition of that workplace. Antle says it'll take a couple of months for Avalon Laboratories to get accredited. He says so far they've done about 100 tests and he expects that will grow into the thousands in the coming weeks. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Canada Border Services is investigating two foreign sailors who've been arrested and detained under the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. The men docked in Makovic yesterday and police escorted them to Happy Valley Goose Bay. Their boat was sailing under a Nor Norwegian flag, though it's not entirely clear that's where the crew is from. Federal rules brought in mid-May prohibit pleasure craft from operating in Canada's Arctic waters until at least the end of October. That includes coastal areas in both northern Quebec and northern Labrador. The move was made to help slow the spread of COVID-19 by limiting outside contact with vulnerable remote communities. The systems in place in McCovic last night have worked. Uh, the RCMP got involved as they should in this particular case and they were taken to Happy Valley Goose Bay where the investigation has been started and we'll, the, uh, we'll have more information once this investigation is completed. For uh, reference, we've had several people who were uh, turned away from various ports of entry in the province under provincial jurisdiction. This, my understanding, is federal because it involves international, falls under the Quarantine Act, and jurisdiction lies with the federal government as uh, exercised through the RCMP. 
Well, there are no new cases of COVID-19 to report in this province, but government is continuing to play it safe. Today, it sounds like the possibility of Newfoundland and Labrador opening up its borders to the rest of Canada soon is becoming more remote. The idea of this province becoming part of a Canadian bubble came up repeatedly at today's COVID-19 briefing. Here now is Mark Quinn took part in the questions that followed, and he's live in our newsroom tonight. So, Mark, what did the Premier have to say about us letting Canadians into our bubble. Well, Carolyn, much like the weather today, he poured some cold water on that idea. Uh, it's been widely discussed that maybe this Friday, July 17th, would be the day for the opening of that Canadian bubble. But today, Dwight Ball made it quite clear that that possibility is very remote indeed. Uh, you know, we're not... Uh, we're not anxious to get there right now. It's, it's making sure that uh, you know, people are kept safe, making sure that we'll continue to work with our public health officials. No decision would have been made. And if indeed we get to a decision point, that will be uh, given out uh, you know, well in advance so can, people can make travel plans. Of course, uh, did uh, acknowledge there have been uh, more cases in Atlantic Canada of uh, COVID-19, but he's uh, saying that um, that hasn't influenced their decision perhaps, uh, and that uh, what's happening is that they're being very careful, uh, and he's saying that um, they're not backtracking. He took real umbrage with, uh, with some, a reporter's suggestion that the province is backtracking on its decision to open up on July 17th. Not backtracking at all. There was never backtracking off anything. It was July 17th would be the earliest possible date. We've always said we would monitor during this time frame. And when we felt, uh, you know, we could do so in a safe manner, it, given the epidemiology, always said we would use public health officials. The only reference to July 17th would have been the earliest possible date that we could consider opening up. So we're very consistent with our approach with all of this. So now, at today's briefing, uh, the Premier also spoke about the possibility that New Brunswick may allow some people from Quebec, from the Gaspé region of Quebec, into New Brunswick. And he was asked very specifically, does that mean those Quebecers will be coming into our bubble in the same way they come into New Brunswick, without having to quarantine for 14 days? And he was very clear that that's not the case. Those Quebecers will also have to uh, have either a travel exemption or self-isolate in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, that is a similar, uh, a similar scenario to what we have within Labrador. Now, in the case of Blanc de Blanc coming into Newfoundland and Labrador, they had to come in with a travel exemption, so they just can't come in from Fermont into the island portion or even other parts of Labrador without a travel exemption. So the same would apply for us, for those residents that would live in the Gaspé region that are moving back and forth to New Brunswick. So that's good news for people who are concerned that the bubble may open on uh, Friday, this Canada-wide bubble. It looks like it won't happen, so people who are nervous about that are probably relieved to hear today's news. Uh, for people who were hoping to benefit, perhaps from tourists uh, or seeing people they haven't seen in a long time, loved ones, family members who live outside the province, uh, those people, of course, will be disappointed by this. Carolyn? Mark, that's here now's Mark Quinn reporting live from our newsroom. Well, there is still only one active case in the province, a person who returned from work in the United States. Dr. Fitzgerald took time today to warn against backlash against those who've contracted the virus. She says these patients are suffering and need kindness, and that backlash can also make others afraid of coming forward if they're sick. I know people are scared, but it is impossible to know the personal circumstances of those around us. And people who are unfortunate enough to contract this disease need our support and our understanding, not our judgment and disdain. So as new cases arise, we must treat people with kindness, compassion, and understanding. If people who test positive for COVID-19 feel vilified, others will most certainly feel reluctant to come forward if they have symptoms. And we need to know about cases of this virus in order to prevent future outbreaks. Well, two teenagers in Cornerbrook decided it was time to give everyone a little boost. COVID life is challenging and the city's Youth Advisory Committee decided to send positive vibes to residents through large, bright, colorful signs. Here in us, Colleen Connors reports. If you've driven through a busy intersection, you've definitely spotted one of these. The big, colorful signs spread messages of cheer. It's just to make people happy and brighten their day, and it seems to be doing its job. The Youth Advisory Committee came up with the idea, applied for a grant to fund it, 
and the city staff plastered the 20 positivity posters at busy intersections, walking trails, and community gardens around the city. During this challenging time, um, people just need to see something that can lift their spirits uh, on a day-to-day -day basis when they're, you know, driving to work maybe when they would rather stay home with their kids or just for youth walking around who are missing out on things that they really love to do. Just to see these signs and realize that, um, you know, life gets better and it is good right now and you just kind of need to see the, uh, the good in every day. We thought it would be a really great opportunity to beautify Cornerbrook, not that it's not already gorgeous, but, you know, bring a little bit of pep and cheer into the community throughout COVID. There's more than just these beautiful, bright signs all over the city. There's a contest associated with them as well, and it requires your best selfie. Yeah, so we would like um, people in Cornerbrook to take a picture of themselves with the sign and use our hashtag CBKindness. Um, and they get a chance to win uh, four um, gift cards for local businesses in Cornerbrook. I think once we kind of saw how great the signs looked, we kind of wanted to take photos in front of them because we thought they were so amazing. And then kind of wanted to inspire other people to do the same. And we thought it would be really fun to have a contest and kind of inspire everyone to get out there, see Cornerbrook, explore some parts that maybe they haven't been to before, and just get a chance to get out there and enjoy the moment. The public has until July 26th to post their pics. Tebow and Buckle hope the signs stay up long after the summer months. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. Nice. Well, turning now to some national news, the Bank of Canada says the early stages of the post-pandemic economic recovery are looking good, but it's going to be a long and bumpy ride before things get back to normal. The bank laid out its forecast today and, as expected, held its benchmark interest rate at one quarter of one percent. David Cochran has the details. If there is a silver lining in this COVID-ridden economy, it's that for Canada, the worst may be over. After a historic slump, the Bank of Canada sees signs of life with a big catch. We've assumed in, in, in this central scenario there is no widespread second wave uh, and, and hence there's no widespread uh, second lockdown. That's a big caveat for an economy that still isn't completely out of the first lockdowns. So in all that uncertainty, some unusual clarity. If you've got a mortgage uh, or if you're considering to make a major purchase or you're a business and you're considering making an investment, you can be confident that interest rates will be low for a long time. The hope is that clarity will jolt confidence and boost spending. And while Canada may be projecting the worst economy since the Depression and the biggest deficit since the Second World War, there are already tentative signs of recovery. The reopenings have revived about a million jobs. Housing prices and housing sales are on the uptick after a pandemic-related deep freeze. Cause for hope, but a long way to go. Business and consumer confidence have been shaken, and consumers are, unlike, are likely to be cautious with their spending. And many people may find it hard to return to work, particularly if schools and childcare facilities cannot fully reopen. All of which shows how long this will take. The central bank is predicting a long climb out of the COVID-19 hole. So while the worst may be over, it's still far from over. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, five wing Goose Bay officials are investigating runway damage that grounded flights at Goose Bay Airport earlier today. Regular morning maintenance found issues with one of the main landing strips. The other was already closed for scheduled resurfacing work. Officials decided it would be quicker to bring that second under construction strip back online while damage to the other is investigated. Flights have now resumed. 
Well, Air Canada is offering refunds for people who purchased tickets on some of the Canadian routes the company cancelled, including several in this province. In late June, Air Canada announced cuts to 30 domestic routes, including closing its centre in Wabush. It cut flights from Deer Lake, Gander, Wabush and Happy Valley Goose Bay. Initially, some customers complained they were given a flight credit to use with Air Canada, even though the airline no longer serviced their communities. Now the airline says it is offering refunds for tickets booked on those routes, as well as options for a travel voucher or points from the Aeroplan loyalty program. Passengers who feel they are entitled to a refund and the airline denies it can also file a complaint with the Canadian Transportation Agency. Well, people living in the west end of St. John's may notice they're getting better cell reception. That's because Bell has completed work on a cell tower that toppled over during a storm earlier this year. The tower, located on Black Marsh Road, has been out of commission since February, leaving many people paying for service but unable to use their cell phones. Today, a spokesperson for Bell said that the tower is up and running. A storm back in February downed the tower, leaving thousands without service on their mobile devices. With the cell tower repaired, service has returned, meaning fewer dropped calls or missed text messages. Well, pretty in pink? A woman in Clarenville caught amazing footage of what appears to be a pink minky whale breach the surface of the ocean. Lorna Baker actually captured two videos of the strange sight. She says without the video, no one would have believed her. Here now is Jeremy Eaton spoke with her earlier today about the colorful encounter. Oh, oh my God, he was pink. Myself and my family had heard of the Cape when we were rolling in, in Long Beach. I've never seen Caitlin rolling in. My brother wanted to go out and get some to put in his vegetable gardens, actually. So I tagged along. We went out, and while we were out there, we thought we were watching two minky whales and then this pink one. We seen the pink first, and there was about 50 of us on the beach, and we were looking at each other, and we were like, okay, everybody's seen pink, right? And everybody agreed because we thought we were going colorblind or going crazy. <laughs> Thank God we weren't. But everybody's seen pink, and then he came up a second time, we saw the pink whale again, and then that we never seen him after, only those two times. Look, it, that's a beluga! I told that you. That is a beluga! It felt amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. Like, there was about 50 people on that beach waiting for the Caitlin to roll in. Everybody there seen it. Nobody could believe what they seen. And then to get online this morning and see in the comments that other people have seen this same whale in different places, it's it's amazing. You seen pink, right? Yep. You seen pink, right? Yep. So we're not going crazy. Everybody was so excited. It was, it was, it was crazy. I, I honestly still can't believe that we've seen it. And I know it's something I will probably never see again. And it sucks. That was too big for a beluga, mate. Well, by it was the color of a beluga. His belly was pink. No, they would never have believed it. That's why I'm so glad I caught it on video. And I got it on two videos, two separate times because people would never have believed me. I went home, I started telling my kids, and they were like, kind of laughing at me. And then I took out my phone, I showed them the video. And they were like, oh my God. Oh my God, I wish I was there. I'm like, yep, you didn't want to go. You should have been there. Love the reaction. Now, uh, this wasn't the first time a pink whale has been spotted. Research scientist Jack Lawson with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans has seen pictures and video of what he's calling Pinky Minky. My first thought is usually rats. I wish I was there with my really good cameras. But uh, yeah, I was interested in it because I, it looked first like it was a pair of feeding minke whales and then the sort of pinkish object came up out of the water. But it looked to me like it was the belly of an animal that was rolling on its side to feed. A couple of things that make this happen. First off is that uh, uh, several weeks ago, someone in Fort Amper sent me a picture and videos of a minke whale feeding there. And it was doing this behavior where it was coming up from below at the cable there and breaching out of the water and smashing down its belly and so on. And when it rolled on its side, it had a nice pinkish hue to the belly. So I think it, like us, if we jumped off a diving board many times and landed on our bellies, we'd get this nice pink undercoating. And I think that was the same for the, the whales here. In addition, like most mammals, you know, as we exert ourselves, we tend to put blood out to our periphery to try and cool off a bit. 
whales do this to a lesser extent than we do. They generally do it through their flukes. But in this case, it could be you're also seeing the pinkish skin coloration between the uh, pleats on the belly as it's warm. I've seen pictures of minke whales elsewhere. They've been leaping out of the water and almost had blood on their bellies because they've been smashing around so much. But I haven't seen this particular pink color. So I don't know if it's an effect of, say, sunset, because you can see the colors of the clouds are quite pink, or if it's really an animal that's that color. It'd be great to have better pictures. The bright pink salt beef. Yeah, We've got a yeah. boiled potato. Just ahead, our series Food and Fun returns as Andy Bullman looks for the best cooked dinner. This weather update is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. This year, it's Stay Home Year, the year to rediscover home.
Well, time for a look at the weather forecast, but before we do, today is St. Swithin's Day, and if you are the superstitious sort and you live on the rainy Avalon Peninsula, that's not great news. Why? Well, we uh, dug into our archives and found video of a beloved historian and old friend of here and now who passed away last year. Here's the lovely Larry Doey explaining St. Swithin's Day on this date back in 2015. St. Swinton's Day is a day named after the Bishop of Winchester in England, and he was a beloved bishop, and when he died, he insisted on being buried in the graveyard with the rest of the people. But nine months after he was buried, they took him out of the ground and they put him into the cathedral that there was a more honored place. And on that day, July 15th, the skies opened up, the poured out of the heavens, and most people believe since that day, on July 15th, if it rains, for 40 days afterwards, it will rain. Well, according to tradition and folklore, we're going to get 40 more days of this fog and wet and rain and misery. Fog, wet, rain, and misery is certainly uh, what we're experiencing here in St. John's today. And uh, hopefully it will not last for another 40 days, but we may just have one more day of it. So let's have a look at the highs today. Quite the difference between Labrador and Newfoundland. 23 is the high in Lab City, but only 9 degrees in Terranova, 10 degrees in St. John's today. It was a chilly one. Tonight, we do have a risk of frost on the West Coast. So if you have any frost-sensitive plants, You'll want to bring those in for sure. A hot and sunny day coming for Labrador once again tomorrow and another cold and rainy day coming for the east tomorrow. So let's have a look at tonight. We do have a rainfall warning in effect. Total of 50 millimeters of rain. We had about 15 to 25 today. Another 15 to 25 expected tonight on, uh, for the St. John's and the Southern Avalon. And here's the frost advisory from Bay St. George right up to St. Anthony. So if you're in those areas, be careful of your plants tonight. Uh, and uh, here's a look at what kind of weather we're looking at on the island. This is where most of the action is overnight tonight. You can see that uh, cloud cover and the rain for the Buren Peninsula, for the Avalon Peninsula, overnight low of 9 degrees, northwest, northeasterly wind rather gusting up to 50 along the coast, getting up to about 70 kilometers an hour, so it's going to be breezier along the coast in the Buren Peninsula area, 5 to 10 millimeters of rain expected there, and some patchy frost tonight, overnight low in Cornerbrook, 7 degrees, but in low-lying areas could get down to uh, plus 2, so that's where that risk of frost comes in. Beautiful, clear night for most of Labrador tonight. Overnight low in Lab City, 11 degrees. So looking ahead to tomorrow, it's going to stay very much uh, the same for the east with that cloud cover and more rain on the way. Not quite as much as we saw today. Nice, clear weather for Labrador as well for the west coast of the island. So we're expecting about another five millimeters of rain for the St. John's area tomorrow, but we're still barely cracking the double digits on the Avalon Peninsula. Two millimeters of rain expected for the Clarenville area and a chance of showers for Marystown, slightly warmer uh, there. As we continue west, things do start to clear off and warm up slightly. Grand Falls, Windsor, looking at 17 degrees as the high. The west coast looks lovely. Uh, Corner Brook, 23 degrees, sunshine right up along the coast, so that's where you want to be tomorrow for sure. And up along the Straits, 26 degrees in Cartwright tomorrow and getting even warmer in the rest of uh, Labrador. Happy Valley Goose Bay, sunshine and 29 degrees. It is going to be a sweltering day there tomorrow and beautiful weather as well up along the coast. Lab City looking at 23 degrees as the high there. So as we head into the weekend on Friday, things staying fairly gray in the east. So we're really into this pattern of gray weather and uh, things do start to clear over for Lab West as well. Some rain moving in on Friday and it's going to stick around for a while. So Lab City is still looking at some nice warm temperatures, 20 degrees with that rain, staying great in Happy Valley Goose Bay on Friday, 28 degrees. The island staying nice and warm as well, 21 in Grand Falls, Windsor, but St. John's, wow. 
Another <laughs> really cold day, 13 degrees as the high on Friday with a chance of showers. Pretty gray day. So that rain continues for Labrador and will continue into next week as well for Western Labrador. Things clearing off slightly on the island, but those temperatures staying cool in St. John's 14 degrees on Saturday, staying into the low to mid 20s for the rest of the island. Chance of showers in the Port of Basque area and clouding over in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Temperatures going down a little bit in Lab City looking at those showers in 22 degrees. So if you're looking at which day would be better in the east, it looks like Sunday is the better day on the weekend with a mix of sun and cloud in 20 degrees. 22 on Monday with some cloud cover. Hopefully we'll be moving back into that uh, 20 uh, degree area next week for uh, central areas and for the west. Very warm but gray as well on Sunday. Looking at some showers there, 25 degrees. And for western Labrador, Sunday is looking like a quite a nice day. 24 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud. And for Labrador, you can see how things are really going to start changing in western Labrador with that rain temperatures staying in uh, you know above 20 degrees they're very warm and humid for eastern Labrador with those showers moving in and 27 degrees as the high there so here is our beautiful weather photo of the day this is in tilting Bogo Island and it was sent to us by Roger Giller thank you so much for sending us this stunning photo Well, tonight we have the second season of our series Food and Fun, where we look at some of the unique roadside restaurants in the province. Tonight, Andy Bullman is looking for the best cooked dinner in the province, and she thinks she found it at Eddie's in Southbrook. And it's important to note this piece was recorded before the COVID-19 pandemic, so you won't see any of the physical distancing, masks, or any of that new normal that we've been getting used to. We're at Eddie's in Southbrook. Let's go get some cooked dinner. I'm here with Elvis and he's gonna teach us what goes into a traditional Newfoundland cooked dinner. Hi. Elvis, how are you? Good, good, how are you? I'm good. Good. Um, okay, cooked dinner. How is it different from Jake's dinner? Uh, cooked dinner usually got a meat, got a meat, like the chicken and beef or turkey, okay, and with gravy. Yeah. But the jigs dinner is just no. sometimes with pot liquor. Jigs dinner is just with the salt beef, vegetables, yeah, and the puddings. When you say pot liquor, what do you mean? Well, that's the liquor that the vegetables and the salt beef uh, is cooked in. Yes. Okay. So this, All right. So do you guys use the salt beef uh, water to boil your vegetables? Absolutely. Yep. Wouldn't that make that too salty, or is it delicious? It's delicious. It's the same saltiness of the vegetables, really. Yeah. Just that the vegetables absorbed whatever salt was in there, right? Wow. Okay, so we got salt beef first. Salt beef, all right. So do you soak it? What do you do with the salt beef? No, we just cut it up and cook it for a while. Okay. I don't like soaking it because it kind of takes the color away from it, right? So all right, okay. So we got the bright pink salt beef. Yeah. We got a yeah. boiled potato. Yes. Now, if I put a roasted potato on a traditional cooked dinner yeah. plate, would you be like, mm, that's not a traditional cook? I would get a chuckle, yeah. You would? Oh, absolutely. Well, okay, oh, yeah, <laughs> all yeah. right, sorry. So that's boiled vegetables only, folks. Yeah. Can you eat this whole plate of food in one sitting, Elvis? Or is this like two sittings? Uh, if I, yeah, I could. You I could, could, yeah. <laughs> I could. Can you tell any of our viewers about the recipe of these puddings, or are they? Well, it's like a magician. You can't, you can't reveal too much, right? Okay, all right, okay. well, you can't tell us, all right. Now here's your meal. Oh my goodness. Now, oh my glory to the world. Look at that gravy. Oh my God. And, and, and the good thing about this, eh? We have a process here. We take all the calories out of this stuff. Oh yeah. How do you do that? You Why is this a closed? secret? I can't yeah. tell you. I can't tell you about that. That's a, that's a secret process. <laughs> Oh Only gosh, that really knows, is yeah. the best goose pudding I've ever had. Yeah. But we sort of got our regular customers on Sundays. So we'll just wrap the plate up. Yeah. Take it. And then, and, bring, and then they'll return the plate? Yep. Bring the plate that back next, so sometime nice. during the week, right? Whatever. I yeah, think a lot of people do that. So. That's really sweet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
Then you don't have to use any takeout containers? No, or? plus we don't have to wash it. <laughs> hey, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you get pot liquor on yours? Uh, no, I like gravy. I like gravy too. I like gravy yeah. too. <laughs> now, uh, with pot liquor, if we, were just, if we never had the meat or the gravy, like, you know, the original jigs dinner, as they call it, you know, just the vegetables and a bit of salt meat, uh, that originated was people in, out in boat, you know, so they just had one pot mm. and threw everything in years ago at the fishing industry. Oh, that's really interesting. Yep. I, now, I, I remember reading that somewhere. Whether or not it's true, I, I don't know, but it sort of makes sense. It makes sense to me. It makes yeah. sense. So you just throw your vegetables in, and, yeah. and you, that's all you have is pot liquor. Well, you made the, you polished that off quite good. I didn't think you'd be able to do all that. <laughs> oh, couldn't help it. That was that was so good. Where should Andy go for food and fun? Send her a message. Food and fun at cbc.ca. Welcome back to Here and Now. A warning now about a silent killer. Last week on the show, we heard from a woman who narrowly escaped carbon monoxide poisoning at her cabin in Placentia Bay. She woke up feeling her heart beating in her ears, knew something was wrong, and called out to her husband. So 
shouted at me to get up and I couldn't get off the bed. I felt like rubber. I had no feelings, nothing. So he managed to get me to the kitchen, which was only like 10 feet away from the bed, and put me on a chair. And I remember seeing him on the floor. We have no idea how long he was on the floor. Apparently, if a propane is not burning clean, it builds up the carbon monoxide. And because there was no window open, there was nowhere for it to escape. So thankfully, Hilda and her husband were able to escape. They were treated in hospital, but stories like that worry John Jonyak. He's successfully advocated to have carbon monoxide detectors become mandatory in Ontario. Anthony spoke to him earlier today. 300 Canadians die every year because of carbon monoxide poisoning. Thousands of others are taken to hospital. John Zignac started a foundation in Ontario to address this safety issue, and he joins us now from Brantford, Ontario. Welcome to the program. Okay, thank you very much for having me. Now, John, you are a firefighter for more than 30 years. You have a personal connection to the seriousness of carbon monoxide poisoning. Tell me about that. Well, uh, back in 2008, I lost my niece, her husband, and both their children to carbon monoxide in Woonstock, Ontario. She was an OPP officer, and at the time I was on the fire department, felt I needed to do something, so I started the Hawkins and Act Foundation for CO Education. Tell me a bit about that foundation. How did you start to lobby the government in Ontario to recognize the seriousness of making carbon monoxide detectors uh, obligatory? Well, I wanted to, to make sure that every person in Ontario, as well as Canada, had a working CSF approved uh, CO alarm. And the only way I could get the education out there, I started by saying, well, I need to get the bill passed. So we lobbied the government. It took me six years to finally get them to pass the law, the Hawkins and Act Act. Is Ontario the only province in the country or jurisdiction in Canada that makes these things mandatory? Uh, no, we have, it's mandatory in Ontario as well as the Yukon Territories. Actually, the Yukon Territories was before Ontario, so uh, they were very active in getting these CO alarms out to all the people in the Yukon Territories, and, and Ontario followed. I know that every year we're told when we change the clocks, it's a good time to change the batteries on our smoke detectors as well. Is there much information on about how many Canadians do not have carbon monoxide detectors in their homes? Uh, not not to, to my knowledge. We, we're working on get, uh, compiling statistics in Ontario since the law passed to see how it affects it. But I do know uh, personally on the Hawkins and Act Foundation, we don't get notified hardly about any deaths anymore. But we used to get a lot of notifications. I think the education in Ontario is working. From your experience, do a lot of people, sir, are they more responsible with their primary residence and then they forget about their cabin or their summer place? That seems to be the case. Uh, we have what we call the CO safety program uh, for summer here, and it's to advocate for CO alarms in boats, trailers, tents, cottages, etc., so that people take CO alarms with them, not only because of the fact that you're farther away from the, uh, a medical treatment, but you're also uh, at a, uh, a remote location most of the time, and uh, to have a CO alarm there is de definitely going to be a, a big advantage for you. Uh, and, uh, you know, it seems to be that when people are on vacation, sometimes they let their guards down a bit. So a final question for you, John. You've got the attention of the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, maybe some politicians watching tonight as well. What advice would you have for our province when it comes to carbon monoxide detectors? I think that the first step is to make sure that everybody in your province gets a working uh, CO alarm and check their smoke alarms as well. But I think the government and the people down there should get a law passed because automatically it saves lives. And once that law is packed, uh, passed, education seems to follow. And that's so important, very, very important. To get everybody to get a CO alarm, put it in their house and get it in today. Well, listen, John, you make a very good case and uh, congratulations on your success in Ontario. We'll see what the reaction is uh, here in our province. Thank you very much. Okay, and if they need more information, they can go to endthesilence.ca. Great. Thanks, John. Thank you. Oh, some good advice there. On a bit of a lighter note, they're intelligent, valuable, and their numbers are growing in Canada. Travis McEwen explains why more and more farmers are raising alpacas. In Leduc County, one farm is unique, where you would expect to find cows or horses, Instead, alpacas roam this hill. This is the newest member of Sunny Hill Alpacas. 
Doesn't have a name yet, it was only born about an hour ago. Still a little wet. The Sept family got their first alpaca 22 years ago to graze their grass. Now it's the predominant animal on their farm. They have close to 100. Their temperament is really good. They're easy to work with because they're not big animals. Um, you only have to shear them once a year. Typically their births are fairly easy. Um, they're, they don't eat a lot. They all poop in the same spot. The wool is produced at the farm's mill, but customers have to wait almost two years to get it as yarn. Probably I'm turning away one or two customers a week at least. Over the past 14 years, Canada's alpaca population has risen by 55%. There's more than 28,000, and 40% of them are here in Alberta. But their rise comes with some concerns for the Lamas and Alpacas Association of Canada. It gets 5 to 10 calls a week from people who want more information about the animal. It's usually after they've got one on marketplace websites. But then they don't get the after sales support, and then they have no idea how to take care of an alpaca. They have no registration, they have no idea of what the animal is or where it's come from. Sort of a back off. On another Alberta farm, alpacas are used for therapy to help people with depression or PTSD. Rin Para has helped more than 300 clients over the past decade. It amplifies the emotional experience for people. They are small enough that people aren't afraid or intimidated, so you're more likely to interact in a comfortable way. Um, they do still protect themselves, they alarm, they spit, they can kick, so um, they still have that ability to push you away, um, but I find that people are much more receptive to them. Canadians are encouraged to register alpacas to track their genetic lineage to ensure as the population grows, so does the quality of their coats. Travis McEwen, CBC News, Edmonton. There are no such things as medical exemption cards. As the debate over masks grows, some who are against masks have found a bogus way to get out of wearing them.
Wearing masks is a proven and easy way to prevent the spread of COVID-19. There's no plan to make masks mandatory here, but the provincial government encourages everyone to have one. Given where we are with regard to our prevalence, uh, we are not uh, mandating masks, but we certainly um, strongly recommend that people wear them uh, when they are inside uh, enclosed spaces or even when they're outside uh, if they're not able to physically distance. Um, so I would recommend that people have a mask on them at all times and, and if they get in a situation where um, they're not able to physically distance that um, they put the mask on. The key to preventing the spread of COVID-19 is physical distancing. And on those occasions where you find yourself in a situation where that's not entirely possible or practical, uh, a non-medical mask in your pocket uh, is better on your face uh, than in your pocket. Well, meanwhile, the debate over masks has led to a troubling new development involving those opposed to wearing them. Bogus cards claiming a medical exemption from wearing a mask are popping up even at hospitals. Lorenda Redekop has that story. They're cards that state you have a medical condition, exempting you from having to wear a mask, but they're fake. There are no such things as medical exemption cards. And people are even flashing them as they try to go into hospitals, posting about it on social media. I've got to get in there. Absolutely. But here's the thing. Just for the meantime, you have to wear a mask. No. But really, um, coming to the hospital with that kind of thing and creating a social media stir is not what people should be doing. She says it's not a lot of people doing this, but it's happened at a number of hospitals. I think that most people um, believe that if you are asked to wear a mask, you should wear a mask. There are people with real medical conditions and uh, those are the people we have to be concerned about, not people who for whatever reason don't want to wear a mask. The cards are being touted by the same people who oppose the lockdown and say masks take away their freedoms. They're even making money selling the cards. It's sort of infuriating a bit. It's, it's a little bit insulting, you know. Dave Watson has cystic fibrosis with a lung function at around 40 percent. He's not sure he'd survive if he got COVID-19. Though he has breathing issues, he says a mask works for him. Doing stairs with, say, groceries, it's, uh, it can, it can uh, be a little bit of a hassle for sure. But normal shopping in that, I can't imagine it's going to hurt anybody. The cards aren't only popping up in Canada. Similar ones, also fake, are being used in the U.S. One version here uses the symbol for the Red Cross. The Canadian Red Cross says it's a misuse of its emblem, that they contacted the group that made the cards and that the group agreed to remove the symbol. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. Fears of a growing COVID-19 outbreak in Montreal have triggered an unprecedented call to action. The city's public health officials say anyone who has been to a bar in Montreal anytime since July 1st should be tested for the disease. Thousands of young adults are lining up even before testing centers open. Yesterday, the wait was hours long. At least 30 cases of the disease have been linked to bars in the Montreal area. Clubs are now being asked to collect the names and contact information of anyone who visits. The number of COVID-19 cases in the U.S. continues to surge. Today in Oklahoma, the governor announced he has tested positive just weeks after attending Donald Trump's rally in Tulsa. Florida has set a new one-day record for COVID deaths, and Texas reported more cases and hospitalizations than ever before. Salima Shivji has more. In Texas, one of the hotspots of the outbreak, many hospitals are at capacity and the state is posting a record number of deaths a day. On the streets of the staunch Republican state, there's mixed feelings on how the president is handling the coronavirus outbreak. It's tough. I wouldn't want to be in his position. Failure. Total failure. His actions and lack of actions have exacerbated the effects of the pandemics on all Americans. 
politics outside amid fresh concerns of politics inside the Trump administration's pandemic response. After an order that hospitals bypass the CDC, a public agency, and instead send virus data to the Department of Health and Human Services, which reports to the president. A worrying sign, say health experts. We're not being guided by science and by public health principles. We've seen a sidelining of the CDC. It comes as an internal fight plays out over the country's top infectious disease specialist, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Efforts to undercut the doctor over the weekend flared up again with Trump's trade advisor, Peter Navarro, penning an op-ed that says Fauci has been wrong about everything the two have ever discussed. An opinion White House officials quickly distance themselves from, saying Navarro went rogue. We're all on the same team, including Dr. Fauci. I have a very good relationship with Dr. Fauci. The doctor seems perplexed by it all. Well, that is a bit bizarre, and I have to tell you, <laughs> I think if I sit here and just shrug my shoulders and say, well, you know, it's that's life in the fast lane, I cannot figure out in my wildest dreams why they would want to do that. But, I mean, I think they realize now that that was not a prudent thing to do because it's only reflecting negatively on them. He says all the mudslinging simply distracts from the urgent crisis, an outbreak far from under control. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Washington.
The mysterious British artist Banksy went undercover in London's underground to deliver a pro-mask message. He posted this video on social media showing how he disguised himself as a cleaner to create his latest pandemic-inspired art. It's titled, If You Don't Mask, You Don't Get and features some of Banksy's signature rats along with surgical masks. London's transportation officials have since removed it, citing their anti-graffiti policy. Well, this next piece of video shows the high stakes of life as ducks. Here's a family of ducks crossing the road. They make it across safely just as a dump truck comes barreling down the road. It appears uh, to be no worry to the ducks, though, who continue on their way. Our Colleen Connors recorded this scene earlier today in Corner Brook and at one point even urged the ducks onward by saying, hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> well, that's it for uh, here and now tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you can uh, join us once again tomorrow evening. But for now, have a great night.